I'm short for this setup here. Hi, how are you all doing today on this really cold morning? <laughs> Hi in the back. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Amy. Thank you, Mary, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I have had over 30 years of marketing experience, of which I have worked with analytics and data science, either adjacent to the businesses I've been on or have directly managed uh, the analytics teams. And I'm thrilled to be here today to talk about um, not just being analytical, but going beyond the data and making unpredictable more predictable because you understand the customer, be it your internal customer, an external customer, if you work in B2B, if you work in B2C. So it's taking that data to the next level. Was I? I was probably clicking the whole time. <gasps> awesome sauce! <laughs> I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. <laughs> that was so cool. Okay, can you go back one side? Or I guess I can go back one side. We'll be upside down, that's the question. Let's, let's do a survey. It will be, all right. Okay, so this is upside down. It's great for a group exercise because it keeps us on our feet. All right, everybody, if you can look to someone next to you, two people, every two people, if you can, look at somebody next to you. I need you to just pair up, all right? Okay, now, that was so funny. Uh, now put your hand in the air and point at this guy, still knowing your partner, right, your partner. Now, look at your hand and go clockwise. Okay, clockwise, 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 whatever you think clockwise is, right? Now you're gonna slowly bring your hand down, don't bonk each other, you're gonna slowly bring your hand down and point to the person next to you. Point to the person next to you. Now I want your partner, keep spinning, keep spinning, and I want your partner to tell you which way your finger's turning. It's counterclockwise, right, okay. But you really thought you were moving which way? Clockwise, right, okay, you can stop. <laughs> um, so I wanted to go through this really simple exercise uh, because really the data you have, the answer you have really depends on the question you're asking and to whom you're asking that question, right? You really were like, I am doing this clockwise and I had to think like, which way is clockwise, right? But it really depends on who's looking at what you're doing as to what your, your answer is. So um, I really wanted to start with this because to understand the unpredictable, you really have to understand the person that you're going to be asking questions of and how are they seeing the world and what does the world look like. Okay, so, um, so understanding your client's perspective is super important, but I'm gonna jump into my perspective first to understand why I'm saying what I'm saying. I gotta understand afterwards how that thing flipped. That was awesome. Um, so I'm gonna tell you about myself, uh, how, I'm how I got influenced to where I am today. Then I'm gonna go into my career experiences and I have some key takeaways and key learnings. And then I'll do a summary and then we're gonna have some Q&A. Okay, so first about myself. So this is gonna have the most words on it of all slides. And I thought when I was doing this presentation, I'm like, it must be because I really care for these people. Uh, on the far side, I have my parents. Uh, my dad was a computer engineer, and they're silent generation people, which means they were born in the 30s. Um, my dad's 89, and my mom would have been 87. She passed away in the 90s. Um, very different people. So my dad, they're both from New York. My dad's from the Bronx. I have to use my hands because they're from New York. Um, my dad's from the Bronx. He was the first one to go to college. He went to NYU. He has degrees in uh, meteorology, environmental sciences, way before it was a thing. And, um, computer science when you used to have punch cards. Uh, he is an expansive hypothesis thinker and idea generator. Um, he looks at the world as if there's problems to solve everywhere. He walked into a Publix once, which is a grocery store, in the deli line. It's like, it's too long. So he sat there, he diagrammed something out. He sent it to the CEO, and he's like, here's how you can increase your profits. And he totally, and he got a letter back. So this is my father my whole life. So it's like, you gotta see the problem, you gotta figure it out, and you gotta tell somebody about it. And my mom, she was uh, from Queens, and she was what I would call the practical dreamer, or realistic optimist, right? We had to get the kids to school, like they need lunch, they need things, but imagine what they could do today. She was a fantastic storyteller, and she loved to engage people in life. Um, I have a sister, 
I'm the older one in that horrible picture with my hair cut short, so the only one I can find. Uh, she's four and a half years younger, and uh, she, because she's younger, she is the rule breaker. Uh, she also is very playful and had a huge open heart. But no surprise to me, she's now a leader in cybersecurity. Uh, for Deloitte, and so she's like trying to find other rule breakers. I think that's what I tell her. She started as one and continues to be in that space. Um, my husband, I've been married for 20 years. My husband and kids, I now live in Seattle for 20 years. Um, took me three years not to come back here and get my hair cut. I lived in Philadelphia for 10 years. Uh, he is a person that always takes risks, and he will always ask for what he wants because he believes that you ask for what you want because you give people a chance to say yes. And he taught me that because the longest time I was too scared to ask for what I wanted because I was scared I would get a no. Uh, so he's in sales, of course, always walking in. Now I have a, a nine and a 10 year old now. Uh, my 10 year old um, is creative, loves math, is in fifth grade, which I'm told is the turning point as to whether or not girls continue in math. So I'm gonna have to really double down and engage there. Uh, she loves animals and she's the fair one. It's like, mom, you have to not talk until the person is done speaking, like, great. That's what I learned there. And my nine-year-old wears her heart on the sleeve. She's crying, she's laughing, she's having a wonderful time. So she's all about having love with life. So between all of them, uh, they provided me with much more of a whole brain uh, view of the world. It's not just art, it's science. It's not just questioning, it's also acting. There's context and decision making, hard driving and time to have fun, and a head and a heart. And so I'm told, because of the background and the way I view things, I see things a little bit differently uh, than other marketers, and I really thank them for that. So on that note, it looks like me, but it's not me. Thank you, Google, for your picture. Um, I love to watch ads. My grandma would say, like, I wish you would pay as much attention to the shows as the ads, because you talk during the shows and not during the ads. Um, I love to understand people. I love to think critically, like my dad, I'd walk in and like, what's the problem to solve? Um, so I wanted to go into marketing, because marketing's the place where you solve problems and you talk to customers and you figure out what can be created with them. And I told my father, the computer science engineer, that I was going into a marketing degree. He said, he was like, what? He's like, don't you go to school to learn a craft? And then you, use that craft to create something, and then it's so good, you don't need to talk to people about it. And I was like, huh, fascinating, no. Uh, you actually go to school to learn the craft of marketing. And so, what does that mean? I thought I would put up here the definition from the American Marketing Association. Marketing is the performance of business activities that drive the flow of goods and services from producers to customers. So what does that mean? We do things like product creations. We do positioning of those products. We analyze pricing across different channels. Um, we do packaging strategy and development. We do creative, we do ads, um, we do performance. And so it's, it is a whole brain way of thinking, how do I create a good product and service and give that to a consumer or customer? And good marketers use data, right? It's not just like, I think this thing might be interesting. Let's just try it. Um, you're using data all along the way, right? What's the right price in the right channel for the right customer at that time? If you have a single serve unit and it's cold in a convenience store, should you charge more for that because of the convenience as you do a six pack in the store? There's all types of things you have to look at and test. Um, and the best, strongest marketers come together with the strongest data science team to I think of really hard what the problem is to solve and then get outside the problem to figure out how do you make someone happy? by servicing them the right way. Okay, so I thought for today I would focus on four different things in my career, uh, 30 years. I was like, I don't know, it has to be data science and uh, marketing, uh, which I wasn't always data science. It wasn't always like, what's the data? It was kind of like, here's the gut, let's see how it works. Um, but much more in the last 15 years I've been able to work with data because data is more less expensive. Data can be organized better. You can analyze it, not just with the person sitting there connected to the computer, you could do everything in the cloud. So it's got, gotten much easier to be strong in data analytics. All right, so my first stop. I show this to my friend. She's like, that's a marketing slide. There's no data on that slide. Um, so I'm gonna talk about my experience and then I'll have the key takeaways up there. Um, so first stop, early 90s, I came out of my undergrad um, into a recession much like I think kids today, right? Um, I had a BS in marketing. 
I didn't have an internship, and I was at the beginning of a recession. That is not the way you go about getting your dream job. So I really wanted to run a brand, I wanted to run a business, and that job was unavailable at that time. Um, what was available, I don't know if any of y'all remember like newspaper one ads from way back when? There might be some in the audience. Um, so the jobs that were available were things like telesales, which is calling people, for a guns and ammo publication in Leesburg, Virginia. Um, working for Roadway Trucks down in Richmond, great company. I thought, oh, logistics, that'd be interesting. It was the 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. shift. No, not interested. Um, and Sally May, working in their defaulted loans division, which was trying to get money back from college kids that couldn't pay their student loans. I was like, mm, sad, but I know college kids because I was one, so I'm going to go do that. So I spent my first six months um, they're really understanding the loan business. How do you get loans? Who gets loans? Why do they get loans? Why do kids default, et cetera? But then I was looking for a role inside the company. I decided I was going to interview with this guy, Mike. And he ran a SaaS SQL department. And you know, I come in, and I'm like, I want a job. He's like, great. Do you program in SaaS SQL? I was like, no, but I know basic. And he's like, it's not the same. I'm like, I know, but like, I could code. This is, I could learn. Um, and then during the interview, he confided in me <clears throat> that even though the business teams were their clients, he was having a real hard time with the analytics team understanding and creating queries that the business teams would use the first, second, or third time the queries were run. And since I had spent time with the business teams, I convinced him that, hey, I could be that person. Like, I could be the person that talks to the business teams and talks back to the analysts, and I can learn SAS if I know, if I know basic, I can learn SAS. So he ended up hiring me. Thank you, Mike. Um, so then what happened was I spent a lot of time learning code, which wasn't too bad, and then spent time sitting with the business people to really understand things and ask questions like, what are you looking for? What problems are you trying to solve? What are you going to do with the information when you get it? And what decisions are you going to make with the data? So my goal was to get these questions and answers to go back then to the analytics team and to help them understand what queries they should be running for the answers. I was so excited. like. I would say, like, my tail was wagging. I was so excited. Um, I talked to, I wanted to share this. I got everybody together. I shared the business problems with them. And it landed like lead on the ground. Because they were like, why are you wasting your time talking to the business teams? Because they should have their act together before they even come to me. Like, I'm going to be running something. I have things to do. I've got programming to do. I don't have time to sit with these business people. And then they kind of left. And so I was just a bit in shock, because I thought my boss had said, this is your job. And then it didn't feel like it was. Um, so I decided to talk to each of them individually about why they were so dismissive. And one of the big things was, was hey, I didn't even engage my own team. So big learning there early on in my career. Engage your own team. What do you want? What are your expectations? What's your pushback? But some of the other things that I learned were that they certainly didn't want some 22-year-old woman sitting across from them telling them something they didn't already know. And uh, they were at least 20 years older than I was. Then the other part was they had a strong belief, as I mentioned, the business teams need to get their act together before engaging for what they needed. And I don't know if any of y'all have felt this when you're sitting across from somebody like, you're wasting my time, but you have to be like, oh, tell me more, right? Uh, and you have to look like you want tell me more, otherwise this is on your face. And they're like, you don't want to know anymore. Um, and then lastly, when really interesting to me, and these were really smart people, um, they were kind of intimidated by the business. So a large part of the reason why I didn't want to sit across from these people was because they didn't kind of understand the language and the things that they were being asked. So I had many aha moments here. I changed my approach. So I sat down with a lead. Uh, the, it's actually the programmer everyone looked up to, but not the most senior person, Haseem. And I talked him through my findings. And he was like, yeah, I kind of agree with those. And we decided how we were going to move forward. So we took some of the less prickly programmers that I knew wouldn't roll their eyes when they were sitting in front of the business teams. And I had them come with me on some of these business meetings to be like, this, isn't, this is fine. You're going, to, you're going to survive through it. It's going to be awesome. And we had to talk about what body language looked like when you sit across from somebody and you're nervous. And you have to look like you're engaging them and want to hear. Right, you rolling your eyes isn't a good thing, but nodding and asking clarifying questions. And one of the things that came out of this was also, you know what, the business people didn't know what to ask. So this also helped them. Why are you asking that? How are you going to use it? Keep asking why, keep asking why, keep asking why. Oh, that's the problem you're trying to solve. 
So no wonder when we ran the queries, it wasn't answering the questions because we, they weren't really clear. So both teams were able to get together, um, be more clear on what they were trying to do, and in the end, we, we ended up running a lot more successful um, queries and information. So um, that was my first. So key takeaways, pulling information from data is, is not uh, the only part of your job. <clears throat> I thought going in, like, we're just going to be pulling it. They had information all over the place. We had data, we had reams papers with the little holes on the side of the old thing. Um, and we were giving that to people, and they just weren't using it. Uh, knowing the problem the data is helping to solve and how the data will be used is equally, if not more important. Right? Understanding what drives human behavior is critical for teaming and accuracy. Like, if your job depends on other people understanding something and communicating to you, uh, your job is then to help the communication. Right? It isn't just waiting for something to happen. It's working with the person and understanding the behavior and getting under that. And then actively listening and having empathy is a powerful tool towards moving things forward. Um, people really want to be listened to and part of the, part of the solution. Um, and it takes a lot of business and personal maturity to be part of those conversations. Right, it's hard to be vulnerable, it's hard to sit in a conversation and be like, oh my gosh, I don't know, and I have to ask questions, and I have to, I don't know in those questions, and I have to be okay with that. And you have to ask others when you know they're nervous and not speaking up. Uh, but it goes a long way when you do that. Anybody recognize this company? It's right over the bridge. So after Sally Mae, um, I realized I still wanted to be a marketer, and being a, my SAS SQL programmer wasn't it. And they're like, why? Let's get out of technology, because that's not going to be something. Um, so I decided to go back, get my MBA, and I went over to Campbell Soup. Uh, I ran V8. We launched V8 Splash in like 98, I think it was. Um, ran part of condensed soup business. I had the tomato soup business. Uh, Prego pasta sauce, among other brands. Um, definitely great marketing training. CPG, consumer packaged goods. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it here because there really weren't the data science kind of deeper learnings that I had uh, outside of your pure traditional CPG stuff. So I'm going to move forward, but it was a great, great learning experience. All right, Starbucks. So move forward to Starbucks. Ten years after working at Campbell's, I decided to join Starbucks. Uh, my husband's from Seattle, so we're like, let's go move out there. Um, and the next example finds us eight years into my 14 years at Starbucks. So at that time, I became responsible for Starbucks rewards, the Starbucks card, and customer data analytics. Um, it was our first customer data analytics team. Because if you think about the ability to have individual identities on a human, to be able to track longitudinally what they do over time, and then do qualitative information on them and connect it back, the loyalty program was great because I had every single person. So if you're part of the program, thank you. Uh, there's a mobile order in store or over there if you need something during the break. Uh, my, my blood is running brown still. Um, one of my first ta ta tasks, though, after uh, taking over Starbucks Rewards was, <laughs> was actually like proving to senior leaders it was something worth keeping. That was fun. So uh, fun to find out your, your first job in your new job is figuring out whether or not you should have that job. So I did have the data analytics team report to me, but I realized pretty quickly that it's like the fox in the hen house, like the data analytics team on my team telling my team we should or should not exist. People would think they're going to say it should, of course. So the first thing I did was I found the finance team, which is the neutral team in the company, and I partnered with them to create kind of like a standalone group of analytics people and the finance people in order to help drive whether or not the business was incremental. So the hypothesis was this uh, Starbucks rewards would drive incremental foot traffic and ticket. What foot traffic is, is you will come into the store one more time because of the program, had the program not existed, or you would add something to your purchase uh, if, additionally, if the program had existed versus not existed. So because people don't have chips in their heads, you can't literally know, and because it was a natural program, we couldn't actually turn off the program. So we had to figure out different types of uh, tests that we would run, scrappy, stuff through the mail, giving people extra stars and stuff to see how the behavior was, et cetera. Um, and we did prove that the program was incremental, and we risk-adjusted to, risk to death because we were so nervous. We wanted to be so conservative with the numbers. It was still incremental. So we go to present to the senior leaders, 
that we believed in the program, et cetera. Uh, we also interviewed them, too, because I want to know why you don't want something to exist and why you do want something to exist. Because you always need to know who in your audience, where they're sitting. Like, who's going to come at you because they don't believe you? And who's going to be on your side? And you want to look them in the eye for confidence, right? So um, we sat, had this meeting. It was with the head of operations. And he was the one the, with the P&L that was like, why are you spending my money? Um, he was like, I don't know that this should exist. We had the head of finance, uh, the head of digital, and uh, about seven other leaders in the room. And I presented the information. And remember, I was when I had data. The company did not have data. And the meeting got really a bit sideways. Um, there was a lot of, I know this and I know that. And the leaders had this really strong point of view that they were using um, single examples. When I see someone walk in the store and see them purchase something, I know they were influenced by the barista, right? This, ah, OK, you know that. Did you ask them? No, but I saw it. OK. So there was a lot of that type of debate. <clears throat> and then on top of that, there was a lot of really aggressive, <clears throat> it got super aggressive about like, then how do you know the data you're pulling is the right data? How do you know, how would you know the analytics are right? Did you do the math? And so it became kind of like an attack. And it was, and I was the only woman in the room and the other one, there were five guys in the room. Um, and you know what, it was, it was super interesting to me because I acquiesced. I was like, oh, maybe you're right. Maybe I didn't look at it the 16th way I should have looked at it to get maybe a better data set that I didn't think of. Of course, we thought about all this stuff. Um, so I left the meeting, and I was very disappointed. I and I kind of felt unnerved. And because these guys aren't like this. Starbucks is a huggy place. Like, you walk in, you talk about your day, you spend 15 minutes not doing business before you start doing your business. So I was a little bit unnerved by how the meeting went. Um, <clears throat> and because I believe feedback is a gift, I asked my director, who was also in the meeting, what happened. And he said, you know what, we did our homework. We were really well suited to stand our ground. And he was wondering why I didn't push back more, like, raw, and you know, kind of yell back at them. And um, he said, you know, did you see Jessica Chastain in the movie Zero Dark Thirty? And so for those of you who don't know the movie or the thing, uh, her character is the one that was maniacally focused on bringing down Osama bin Laden. And she was super data-centric in regards to how she found uh, where he was located. And she was extremely confident in this one particular scene that he wanted me to, to look at again, which is like, I know he's 100% he's there. Now, the scene we're going to show you is a scene, but it's kind of cut down because there's a lot of cursing in the beginning. So we thought maybe not so much for this organization. But um, if you want to see the whole scene and all the cursing from the CIA director, and it's a fantastic movie. Uh, if you haven't seen it, watch it. So if you just play the scene real So he's like, be her. And I'm like, what? Uh, she's just so confident. He's like, hey, I know you know the information. Like, you know the information. So <clears throat> there was a lot of, you know, reflecting on the meeting, there was a lot of stylistic differences in the attendees. Um, there was a lot of masculine energy being thrown around. And it was, um, I wasn't kind of absorbing it in a way that was uh, meaningful to how I could react to the situation. So uh, one of the things to note, and that I really liked, you know how he, there was a gentleman in there, he said, I want to know what Maya thinks. So the ask of y'all, if you're sitting in a meeting, is if you see something like this going on, you do have a role in the meeting to be like, let's do a timeout and let's see what this person has actually been saying. But it's super helpful to do that. So you can't control the way th the people are in the meeting, but you can control the way you are and how you center yourself and how you put your feet on the ground and how you show up. And it's hard, and it still happens. And the question is, is how do you center yourself going in, and how do you um, get allies in the room to help you uh, on the way out? So key takeaways, do your homework. I don't have to tell this audience that. Of course you're going to do your homework. Of course you're going to know what you need to do going in. Confidently but humbly have a point of view. This isn't false confidence. And when I've talked to other women about this, they're like, well, but I might not have looked at it 17 ways till Sunday. It's like, yes, but you did the best you could with the information you had in the moment you had it, so stand in that. Take calculated risks and flex with new information. Just because you have a point of view doesn't mean you can't change your, your mind later. And um, hold yourself and the team accountable. So if it's wrong, you say it's wrong and move on. Uh, and oh, oh yeah, channel her, because she's awesome. I still think of red hair when I get stressed out. OK, so mobile RMP, moving on. Um, 
So uh, the third experience is about the line problem. You guys might know the line problem. You know when you walk up to the store and you look in the window and you're like, I'm not going to go there. There's too much people in line, too many people in line. Um, <clears throat> so part of the expectation of working at Starbucks is you work the store, especially if you're at he in headquarters or the support center. Uh, you do have data points you get clearly. You have customer service scores and those things, and you know this store was good, that one was challenged, this one is clean, that one is dirty. Um, but you don't know why. Like, why is the store dirty? What is going on with the satisfaction score? So that's why you work the stores and you go to see, so you have your quant and your, and your qual. So, um, so for example, if you know that there are dirty bathrooms and they have a direct impact on food, so you guys, like, if you walk into a bathroom and the place is gross and you're in a restaurant, do you think the food's gonna taste good? No, right, so it's one of the things that restaurants do is you have to make sure the, the bathrooms are clean, but it has to be systematic. So why would it be dirty? Do you have friends ever, you walk into their apartments and you're just like, ugh. I'm not gonna like, use the towel because I don't know the last time it was washed. Right. So it could be a training issue, like maybe the staff doesn't have the same expectation you do as what clean is. Could be that when you go into the bathroom and you've taken the toilet paper out, it all like, you have to have a shredder where all that like stuff goes all over the place. Well, in a store that has thousands of people and you can't get that stuff off the ground, it's dirty, it's gross. So you have to know the problem you're trying to solve. So um, here's a, some data points from 2012. Uh, from 6.30 to 9.30, we realized that if there are nine people or more in the line, people would bail. They'd jump, they would leave the store. Um, and when we did low estimates of the loss of business, we estimated that it would be 75 to $100 million a year in just those people in those three hours leaving the store. So it's a big enough business get to get under it. So having run the loyalty program and we have the, the, the assets in order to maybe help solve this problem, um, we wanted to get in the store. So we took the analytics team, we took the insights team, we took a couple operators, and we all went to stores to talk to people and ask them why they were bailing. <clears throat> so when we saw someone leave, we would ask them some questions, et cetera. Well, of course, they didn't want to wait. They didn't want to stay there because they couldn't wait. So the emotion they were exhibiting was frustration. Okay? Now, if they stayed and they were frustrated, then they got angry at the employees, the partners, because they're like, move faster. Like, don't get the cups right now. Make my drink. So we had frustrated and angry customers that realized if they went just down the street to get a cup of coffee, they'd be happy. So this is awesome for the brand, right? Frustrated, angry customers that are happy when they leave your restaurant. Okay, so not good, not good for the business. So, um, so we're in the stores, we're figuring all this out. I happen to be in Orlando where my dad is and I went to Disney World, which is like fun, everybody should go. Um, I'm standing in line for the Minions ride and I don't, do you guys know Fast Pass? Okay, it used to be you got a piece of paper and it's like, come back at 3.45 and you're so excited because you're the smart one knowing I'm not going to stand in line. So <clears throat> I'm in line for, the, for this and they were just started to go mobile. It's when you can like scan your app before you do it. And I put like these two things together. I'm like, wow, if you don't have to wait in line at a, at a park ride, maybe you don't have to wait in line at a Starbucks. And so because I understood the business problem and what was going on in people's head and that they would want to stay but are not staying because they're frustrated because of the line, then how do I solve for those people? Looking outside the industry, understanding the problem and putting those things together was super helpful. And that's how we ended up with mobile pay, but there's a lot more that happened to get from here to there. But that's the story in regards to looking at data but understanding it in a way that then you can apply the problem. <clears throat> So know the why behind your data. Stretch yourself to learn from your mistakes. So a lot of the stuff that I applied was from stuff that I learned earlier in my career. And answers to your problems can come from everywhere and anywhere. All right, Zillow. <clears throat> Sorry, does anybody have <clears throat> some water? Oh, right, thank you. Oh, that's not mine, no. <laughs> I mean, pre-COVID, sure, but not. <laughs> Although someone in the audience is gonna go, statistically, you can't get it from drinking water. Okay. Um, <laughs> so after Starbucks, um, I went to Zillow, and they brought me over because I had customer experiences at, Z at Starbucks, and they were gonna move from an ad model. So when you're on, you don't pay for anything on Zillow, right? You're like, I love this house. Maybe I can afford that house. The uh, agents pay for all that, because they're paying for ads. But Zillow wanted to bring up the idea that they could help you move. They can give you a loan. They can find that house for you. They will work with agents to put you in the right home. 
And so they brought me over to do that, to reposition the brand and to help uh, understand really what things needed to be in place for a good customer experience. And I'm gonna talk about a little uh, here, not about the, um, the data per se, I'm gonna talk about the employees, which may seem odd because it's kind of like a tech company. But in order for you to change a business and change a brand, the people that do the work have to understand what the shift is, right? They can't just, you can't just expect a bunch of engineers that were there for 15 years to change what it is they do every day. You have to inspire them to do something different. So even though I was brought in to change the brand and do the advertising and performance, I did have the insights team under me. I had a human-centered design group under me, B2B and B2C marketing. I thought one of the first things we needed to do is look at the mission and be like, we achieved the mission, so what's the new vision? How do I inspire people to move forward? So we did a lot of um, qual and quant with the employee base. So I don't know if anybody here is focused on employee uh, statistics or data science, but there's a whole group of people um, at most companies that are focused on employee welfare, how are they thinking and feeling, what do you need to do to care for them in order to have a great uh, employee base. So I worked with them to figure out what does our founder think and know? What does the leadership team think and know? What does the program manager think and know? And is everybody on the same page with where Zillow wants to go? And it turns out they weren't. Everybody was all over the place. No one knew what we were doing. So how, if a brand is a promise you make to the customer, if McDonald's needs to be fast, inexpensive, and consistent, and all of a sudden they open up a, uh, a store that's slow with a menu that changes all the time that's expensive, your brain's like, what? This isn't McDonald's. Right? You have to make sure that your brand is doing the thing you're promising it to do. And that means your employees, every single one of them, who hires people, who engineers for you, who markets for you, needs to understand in their conscious and subconscious what your business is. So what we did is we actually um, took all this information and took all this data and we had to figure out how do we communicate this to all the employees. And we created, uh, this mission video was the kickoff video to our employees, but it came with a whole double click into here's our values, here's how you apply it, here's the customer um, impact that you'll have, et cetera. So I wanted to play this for you. It started as a street address. Bedrooms, half baths, square feet. I'm so happy. But over time, this place is where you came into your own. You learned how to cook, how to adult, and then you outgrew it. When you moved here, you fell in love with the city and something more. In this home, you made a life together. You became pet parents and then real parents. And then life happened again. You moved up, or broke up, or moved back. Our homes change our lives and hold entire chapters of our stories. And each time we move, no matter why we move, we grow. At Zillow, we know how powerful moving can be because we see it firsthand. We get to help millions of people move their story forward every single day. But moving is also really hard. And that's why we're doing everything to transform the way people move. No longer just a tool for dreaming about houses. We are an inspiring and supportive partner to give people the power to unlock life's next chapter. So we could have given them data, right? I could have had a spreadsheet and gotten on a stage and talked about like, we're gonna help people move. Ah. And here's the data, we're all separate and no one's agreeing and knowing what that is. So the point is like you can have the information, but it's how you tell the story with the information so it can be consumed by the people that need to see it. And there are lots of people that would like love that spreadsheet, right? Awesome, but there's also lots of people that would just see numbers and not understand what you're saying. So how do you take your data, know your audience, and understand how to communicate it? So there were clearly double clicks. Um, I like to tell folks, you know, if, if people process in four ways, you're relational, like, hi, how are you doing? You're contextual, what are we doing? You're structural, I wanna know one, two, three, and you're analytical, here's the number. 
all of your presentations should be set up to address those, those types of processors. Otherwise, you're going to miss part of your audience. So key takeaways, everybody is a great ambassador of the brand. It's not the marketer running the brand. The marketer helps communicate what it is the brand is, but the people doing the work are your brand. right? The people hiring people are your brand. So everybody impacts the brand. And brand meaning like it could be a nonprofit. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, but whatever your company or organization name is. Um, don't feel like you have to dummy down the data. Some of the conversation I had with wanting to do a video was, oh, we're dumbing down the data. And like, no, you're making it consumable in a way that people can see it and react to it, okay? And then you're giving other information to people that consume it uh, in a different way. Um, understand how to put the data in a format so you can internalize it. I have written here, no spreadsheets for creatives. If you're ever working with an agency, don't give spreadsheets. They want an inspirational conversation. Um, but some people then do want the data, like the folks that are actually having to create the product. Um, and if you're struggling to tell a story, ask for help. Storytelling is hard. And if you can't do it, wouldn't expect you to be able to do it off the bat. Ask for help. And it's fine. There's lots of resources for it now. And you'll be super strong when you do. OK, so in summary, um, these are some just key takeaways from the conversation. Uh, listen, be curious, and understand the question before you start doing something. Like, why are you doing it? How is it going to be used, et cetera? Validate, actively listen, and have empathy for the person across from you. Many times they're just as nervous as you might be sitting there, or just the brief conversation before you dig into stuff because it's a human talking to another human, dig in, et cetera. Um, you'll have many customers in your life. You have internal clients you do stuff for. You have external customers you do stuff for. Who are they? What are they interested in? Uh, context, 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 and data, data, data. They go together. Um, you and your voice matters. So going back to the conversation of sitting in the meeting, don't catch yourself, especially for the women out there, but all of you, like if you feel yourself getting smaller, you're getting smaller. right? Take up your space. Put your feet on the ground. Use the voice from your stomach. Your voice matters. You're in the meeting for a reason, so be in the meeting. You play a crucial role in any company's success. Again, they hired you for a reason. And I say company loosely because I had companies, but some of your um, you know, educational institutions or nonprofits and those kind of things. It's the place in which you sit, in the, in the groups that you're in, right? In your work groups that you're in. And then soft skills are as much, if not more, important than your hard skills. We talked yesterday about just try hard, just keep trying hard. Well, you're trying hard. All of you are trying hard. It's trying hard and doing, doing the hard skills and figuring out the soft skills. Showing up to have people feel as if you value their opinion as well. So that's, that's my, my conversation. Um, combining your data science analytics and programming chops with curiosity, empathy, and inspir inspirational data sharing will go a long way to move whatever organization or group you're in forward. And who doesn't like a good RBG quote? in a presentation, um, fight for the things that you care about, but do it in a way that'll lead others to join you. So thanks so much. Hopefully you found something in the conversation.